Well, if you want to open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, that is where we will be. Um, we will not get past chapter one, but we will, if everything goes well, finish chapter one, uh, and then we'll be able to move on. For those of you that are, this is kind of a new thing, we try very hard to create an opportunity in our gathering to hit on all five of our values. Um, we want a time for you to be able to amplify the name of Jesus. That happens through your own personal connection with Christ. It happens with engaging other people. It happens in musical worship. It happens in all kinds of ways, but we want you to be able to amplify the name of Jesus because we have gathered together as the church. Community is a huge part of who we are as a church, and so we want you to come and meet new people and, and get engaged in what God is doing and that we are better off together than we would be singularly by ourselves. And so community is a huge part of what we do. And prayer is absolutely significant. It's not easy sometimes to just break and pause and have those awkward, oh, I'm not sure I know this person or I'm not sure if I can pray with this person or what does that look like? But we try to make it a practice that during our gatherings, there's moments where we can come together collectively and pray. So if you make Second Mile part of your routine, part of your time to say, I want to connect with a group of people who love Jesus, we are going to say, hey, let's pray together. Um, that doesn't mean you always have to turn around and say, let's pray together. You may need a moment to just pray by yourself, but we want to emphasize the reality that says we will be people who pray. We will be people that see what happens in our community and what happens in the world and will be a people that pray. Another core value is truth. What does it mean for us to proclaim truth? What does it mean for us to resonate with truth? What does it mean for us to know and understand who the truth of Scripture really displays? And that is ultimately what Hebrews is about. And I lost my clip and I'm really sorry and I don't know where it is. There it goes. Let's see if I can do it by myself. Oh, I did it. Woo. All right. So that's what we're going to get into. Truth. What does it mean to know Jesus? What does it mean to know that he is truth? Why is that so controversial in our culture? Why is the fact that Jesus is truth is a point of tension for us who live in a world that is at the very least skeptical of that um, reality, that truth? The title of tonight's message is this, Confidence Promotes Action. Now, as you think through that title, I want you to just think through the merits of the words themselves. What, it, what does it mean for you to have confidence? What does it mean for you to be a promoter? What does it mean for you to be a person of action? We're going to read Hebrews chapter 1 verses 5 through 14, and we're going to carry right on with what we stopped with last week. I'll give a little bit of review, but I want us to really get into the meat of what God has in store for us when we are jumping into the topic of Jesus as God's Son. Starting in verse 5 of Hebrews chapter 1, it says this, For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of, of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them up like a garment. They will be changed, but you are the same. And your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? And they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who, to, who are to inherit salvation. 
chapter 1 of Hebrews, the writer skips all the introductions, skips the formality of saying greetings to you from your brother so-and-so. All of that is not there. It gets right into the point and says, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the reason we have gathered together. And even though you were dispersed throughout the modern world at that time, and even though I showed you where they may be located, where this letter would have been sent first on the, um, let's see if I can get my directions, on the western coast of Turkey, as you think through that, that location, what does it mean for people who grew up in a Hebrew household, who were engaged in a Greek culture, who were worried about what this faith might look like because Paul had just recently been martyred, persecution was commonplace around them, and they're thinking to themselves, does it even matter? Does faith even matter? Can I just go back to the tradition and the thousand years of loyalty to Judaism? What is so special about Christianity? And the author of Hebrews speaks and says, what is so special is Jesus is the Son of God. Last week, we kind of ended on these two Um, points of clarification that the author wants us to know. And the first is this, Jesus as the Son. You heard me, and these are probably in your notes if you took notes last week. What is so special about Jesus being the Son? The first is this, that he was sent by the Father. You see that take place in John 14, 24, that Jesus existed with God, and yet part of Jesus' mission before the creation of the world was to be sent into the world so that he could create the opportunity for the redemption of mankind. So he was not only sent by the Father, but Jesus was not created. He was present during creation, John 1. Not only was Jesus present during creation, but he, was, he made himself equal with God. What got Jesus murdered, what got Jesus crucified, what got Jesus arrested was not that he was this small little um, town rebel. It was because he committed in the minds of all the people, especially the spiritual leaders of that time, blasphemy. He continued to claim, I am God. Worship me. Another distinction of Jesus as the Son is Jesus is used, uses the Father-Son language to teach that he was equal to the Father in nature, but subordinate to the Father for the mission. So we talked about this truth that says Jesus is the Son of God. But there's something else that comes right alongside that truth, and it's this idea of Jesus is the one and only begotten Son. Now, we don't use that word begotten currently. That's not part of our modern day description or language, but begotten is a very poignant and serious term that is used to describe Jesus. So not only is Jesus God's son, but he's the one and only begotten son. It's the same word that's used in John 3.16. If you know any verse, if you've grown up in church at all, you probably are familiar with John 3.16. And in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son. Now, a lot of modern day translations take the word begotten out because we don't speak that language. And yet, begotten is a very, very important word. So what does begotten mean? And why is the author going over and over and over in the first chapter of Hebrews saying, hey, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. And again, which brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and it goes through all these descriptions and right above that in verse five, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. This is not simply a term used to describe Jesus' birth in Jerusalem. This is a term that says there is an eternal generation of the Son, which means this, Jesus has existed always. There is not a beginning to Jesus. Jesus and God coexist. Not only is Jesus God's Son, but Jesus was present at, in all time and at 
creation. So what does it mean about begotten? And why is this important? And we'll see as we work through the material of this evening, if we are going to follow God, if we're going to understand God, if we're going to pursue him with all of our heart, then we have to settle once and for all the character and the truth of Jesus. And the author of Hebrews wants to settle it right out of the gate. Let's talk about who Jesus in fact is. So bear with me as we look at several different words that we use. We use the word make. We use the word create. And we don't, but I want us to kind of move and shift into say, what if we use the word beget? You see, the first two can have the same objects, but usually elevates the act to an art. So you can say, I made something. You know, um, I was at school and I, the teacher made me make this thing, and so I made this thing. Now, usually when we use the word make, I could say, I made this painting, or I made this um, puppet out of a, you know, lunch sack, or I made whatever. We can say made about a lot of things, and typically we don't have a lot of ownership when we say made. But we can use use the same object of being made and use the word create, and then all of a sudden ownership changes. I created. I didn't just make this side table. I created it. I designed it. I put blood and sweat and tears into the creation of this thing. What I would say about my chicken coop is I didn't just make a chicken coop. I created a chicken coop. And my chickens are happier because it has been created, not just made. Every time I go and view my chickens, I have to view the wonder of it, of their coop. Because I created it, right? We have ownership in the creation of the things that we create, whether it's music or art, whether it's a masterpiece that is hung in a museum, whether it's a tremendous, beautiful, unbelievable symphony, it is imprinted by the creator. If you create, there's a part of you that's in that creation. So you can use the word make, and it somewhat translates, but when you use the word create, all of a sudden, whew, you feel proud. It's exciting. You want to tell people about, creation, about that creation because there's a part of you in it. But here's the difference between make and create, although create communicates a higher level of ownership, here's what beget means. You see, beget has to do with a son or a daughter. It only means you produce a child that has your nature. There's a difference between create and beget. Now, my family, and we're going to get to this in a second, so you got to kind of hold on to all the, the ideas of this. There are children in my family that have been beget. So they have the nature of Angel and I. They look like us. They have the same color eyes as us, the same color skin, the same shade of hair. They have interesting qualities about them because genetically, or they don't have lack of hair, Yet, sorry, Kyle, I hope that doesn't happen to you. I, I really pray it doesn't happen to you. Um, but there's nothing wrong with bald heads. And, you know, Glenn's looking at me like, hey, what's up with that? So anyway, so, <laughs> so you can only be secure if you're bald. People talk about it all the time. So my children are begotten from me in the nature of this relationship. But, and I'll get to this in a second, I have a child that does not have my quote-unquote physical nature. So we'll get there in a second. Just hold that thought. But you see, this idea of beget is limited by the human language, but it's understood because of the strength of the concept. So follow the, the, the connection. Jesus, as God's son, has the same nature as the father. Okay? Now we're limited by human co concepts, so just kind of let it move here for a second. If Jesus has the same nature as God the father, then Jesus is divine. God is divine. And if Jesus has the same nature as God, which by the way, no one else has the same nature as God, then Jesus himself is divine. And if Jesus has the same nature as God, then Jesus is eternal. 
the term in begotten in John 3.16 and the term that's used in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 5 is the term used to describe his nature, and here's the point, not his beginning. There's a sharp difference. It's not to say God gave birth with some deity to Jesus. That's not. Jesus did not have a beginning. What it is saying is Jesus has the nature of God. He is co-eternal. He has existed for all time. He has the very nature of God. So even though we're limited by human nature, that is the concept that the writers of Scripture are trying to relay to us as we read that word that sometimes we're not familiar with. You see, the word begotten has a prefix in the original language. And the prefix is the prefix mono, which we understand. So the mono prefix in the Greek is the word monogeneous. There is only one. Jesus's relationship with God is unique. No one else has the relationship with God than Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Mono. No one else has that same nature. Now, this is important if we want to understand how the Trinity works, if we want to understand how the Godhead works, if we want to understand the form and the function of Jesus, if we want to understand that we ourselves should be worshiping Jesus. What is going on? Oh. My ear shrunk, I think. That's what happened. All right. We're there. If we want to be a people who worship Jesus, we must understand that Jesus is not just the Son of God, but he's begotten. And because he's begotten, his relationship with God is unique. And the uniqueness of that relationship is Jesus is equal to God. God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit coexist, co-eternal, forever. And that's the mystery of the Trinity. The Trinity really can't be explained very well. But the writer of Hebrews wants us to understand two concepts. Jesus is the Son of God, and Jesus has been begotten by the Father. So this brings up another beautiful, redeeming, glorious act. Go back to my family. I can look at my family of six, four of which are my children, the other is my wife, and there is something so very familiar about the word begotten. Because if I look at my Four kids, three of them has, have physical distinctions that they are begotten from my family, but one child has all the other characteristics of our family, just not the physical ones. Because why? Because she has been adopted into my family. She is co-equal in the begottenness of our family. She is every bit as much my daughter. It is a beautiful display of how God operates. And so Jesus is unique because he has the very nature of God. But the beautifulness of what happens in salvation is we have been redeemed and there is a glorious eternal kingdom act of adoption. You see, you and I can call God Father as well. You and I can look at God and say, we have been adopted by grace and given the divine nature by the Spirit so that we may be called the children of God. Jesus, he is very God of very God. He is the only begotten Son of God. But you and I, we have the ability through the power of the Holy Spirit and through the grace of God to be adopted into his kingdom. And so why should we not go back? Why should we not be resistant to what God is trying to do in our lives? Why should we not slip away from the purposes of God? Because you can call him Father. Because you are part of his family. Because there's something unique about that relationship that God wants to move in you to accomplish something bigger than you could by yourself. So here's the first set of questions to kind of dig deeper into this whole Jesus is the Son. He is begotten from the Father. Have you acknowledged Jesus as God's Son? <laughs> it's a big question. Do you see Jesus as divine? Do you hold Jesus in the utmost importance, of the utmost importance? 
As you think about Jesus, as you think about faith, as you think about Christianity, as you think about other world religions, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, where does Jesus sit? Have you allowed other things to diminish Jesus' value and influence in your everyday life? You see, when I'm tempted to do things the way I want to do them, what's really happening in that moment is I'm saying it's it's more self-gratifying to engage in that particular sinful behavior than it is to acknowledge the beautiful grace that has been given me to call God dad. It's a hard place to be, but... Are we diminishing our affections of Christ when we engage in everyday life? Does the beauty of the Trinity move you towards worship? Or does the beauty of the Trinity move you towards skepticism? The Trinity is a mysterious, 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 mysterious thing that cannot be explained through human language ultimately. If we really wanted to nerd out, I have this crazy seminary humor that I could show you a video on YouTube. I'm not going to expose you guys to that, but it's really funny. And if you're interested in that, maybe we'll put the link on it so that you can just laugh in a really twisted seminary way. I don't know. But, but, But when you think about the Trinity, the number one thing you should think of is it is a mystery. But it doesn't mean it's no less true. And the writer of Hebrews is saying we must understand the status, the reality of Christ. So why does it make you a skeptic? Or why does it move you towards a broader, a deeper, a bigger movement towards worship? Why or why not? And then the last question, what will it take for you to truly be influenced by God speaking? You know, when I look out into this room, there's a lot of people that I know. There's a lot of people I know the depth of their stories. There's a lot of people that I know I don't know the depth of their stories. There's a lot of people I don't know. And the question that is posed in this last set of questions is, what will it mean for you in the fabric of your life, in the story that that is being written about you? Why are you here? Why are you listening to this? What are the circumstances that brought you here? Is God trying to speak to you? And I am convinced that he is. And so are you listening to what he may be trying to say to you? Hebrews, chapter one especially, that gets us involved in the book, speaks very clearly that Jesus as God the creator of the universe, Jesus as God, the giver of life, Jesus as God, the one who purifies our sins, Jesus as God, the one who sits at the right hand of the Father, Jesus as God who gets worship from all of creation, Jesus as God should be worshiped. There is an exclusivity about Jesus. There is a superiority about Jesus. There is a no common place concerning Jesus because Jesus is ultimate. And the writer of Hebrews is trying to get the audience, get the receivers of this letter to understand, yes, you grew up in this environment. Yes, you've been exposed to these things, but there's a reason Jesus came to this earth. There's a reason that history changed when Jesus died on the cross and then was rose again on the third day and then ascended into heaven. These are real things that happened and it changed history. Hebrews speaks of the clarity of Jesus being the son of God, being God, being the one to be worshiped because it separates Christianity. It separated Christianity from the cult of Caesar. Think about what was happening in Rome. Caesar declared to be a deity, a deity big enough and strong enough and more powerful so that he should be worshiped. And what Christianity was saying, what Jesus was saying is give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but give to God what is God's. And the subtlety of what Jesus said is you will give God, the true God, me worship. So Christianity separated the cult of Caesar because of the strength of the truth of who Jesus is. 
in fact was. You see, it continues. It separates Christianity from Judaism. There's something unique and special about the Messiah has come. The Messiah has conquered death and hell. The Messiah has done all the things that the Old Testament spoke he would do. The Messiah is returning. The Messiah is a real thing. And even though the Messiah did not meet the expectations of what the modern day Jews in that time when Jesus came thought he would meet, he absolutely met all the expectations of what the prophet had spoken of, which is why the writer of Hebrews says, you have heard it in many ways and long ago that the prophets spoke of Jesus, the Messiah. Christianity is separated from Judaism because of Jesus. It separates Christianity from Islam. What's different? Why is Jesus the point and not Muhammad? Why is Christianity, if it's dealt with correctly according to the word of God, a place of peace, a place of surrender, a place of turning the other cheek, a place of sacrifice? Why is it different? You see, we have to settle these things if we're going to be a people who follow Jesus with all of our heart. There is no room in Christianity for pluralism. It was never intended to be there. It separates us from the cult of Caesar. It separates us from Judaism. It separates us from Islam. We will see the content of Hebrews chapter one. It also separates us, Christianity, from Jehovah's Witnesses. We're not going to get into the big, huge thing, but this is the basic of it, which Hebrews 1 goes into. Jesus is no archangel. He is God. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus was referred to as Michael the angel before he came to this earth. That's one of the twisted theologies of the doctrine of Jehovah's Witnesses. We're not going to get into that, but if you engage in culture, if you engage in different belief systems, if you engage in different worldviews, why do you care about Jesus and what separates Jesus from every other world thought? Finally, it separates the fact that Jesus is God. It separates Christianity from Mormonism. Again, we're not going to get into all of the facts, but at the At the foundation of what Mormons believe in their doctrine, they believe that God and Jesus were separate physical people who dwelled on the earth. God was Jesus' father, and both men died. That's at the foundation what Mormons believe. According to the Gospel Principles, which is a Mormon manual, the first spirit born to our heavenly parents was Jesus Christ. Now, again, I'm not going to get into all of the doctrine that Mormons believe, but the foundational point that I do want to get into is Mormons do not believe that Jesus is God. Mormons are not Christians. How do we engage that? How does, that makes us, that makes us feel uncomfortable. When we call out different worldviews, when we call out different opinions, when we say we believe something to be true, which means we believe something else to be false, that is uncomfortable. And yet we go back to last week's material, last week's idea and say, hey, are we committed to the truth of scripture even when it contradicts our personal convenience? It's just easier if all paths lead to heaven, but they don't. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is trying to get us to understand. Jesus, God's son, is the creator of the universe. Jesus is the redeemer of his people. Jesus is the king who rules at God's right hand. He differentiates every world religion and he points us to the truth that is found in his word and it points us to the reality of his character. Verse seven, The writer of Hebrews goes on, not only is Jesus God's son, not only is Jesus in fact God, he has coexisted for all of eternity. He was part of creation. The universe owes everything to him. Then he wants us to make sure we get the point. And he says in verse seven that Jesus is superior to the angels. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame 
of fire. He's actually quoting the writer of Hebrews. Remember, there's seven Old Testament quotes in the first chapter of Hebrews, and here's another quote, and it's Psalm 104.4. And Psalm 104.4 says, he makes his messengers winds, his ministers of flaming fire. But you see, if you notice, if you look at your Bible, your Bible either may say, he makes his messengers winds, his ministers of flaming fire, or it may say he makes his angels winds, his ministers of flaming fire. There's a difference. And the difference is between the Hebrew Old Testament and the Septuagint, which is the Greek Old Testament. And there's a reason it has been changed. And there's a reason that Hebrew, the author of Hebrews, quotes the Septuagint because he wants people to see this is relevant to the culture in which you are living He makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. God uses angels to execute his will and they serve him in a mighty way, forceful as the wind and destructive as a streak of lightning. When their task is completed, however, they return to him as humble and obedient servants. Although they perform mighty deeds, they remain lowly attendants. Nowhere does God ever honor an angel by giving him a reward for services performed. Nowhere does God promise an angel any gift, distinction, or rank. An angel is an angel and will remain an angel. Jesus is superior to angels. Angels are real and they have a role. But the role is not to be worshipped. The role is to serve. What does that mean for us? What is the writer trying to get us to understand? What he's trying to get us to understand is that the role of angels is to serve the church. The role of angels is meant to aid and serve God's adopted children. That's why when you read a verse like this, Psalm 9111, which says, for he will give, for he will command his angels concerning you, speaking to us, to guard you in all your ways. Angels aren't meant to freak us out. Angels aren't meant to create cool sci-fi movies. Angels aren't meant to be put on our shelves and look cute and chubby and fat and talk about love. Angels are actually a servant of God toward the church. What does it mean to know and understand the activity and the role of angels? That same verse is quoted in, so it's not just an Old Testament concept, it's quoted again in Luke chapter 4 verse 10. Write down Luke 4.10, it's the same verse. Verse, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Then we get to verses 13 and 14 of chapter 1. The writer of Hebrews asks a rhetorical question. And to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. You see in verses 13 and 14, again, the quote is Psalm 110.1. The process of bringing enemies under the feet of the king is often aided by angelic activity. Colin, come up here for a second. (laughs) He's like, oh no. This is Colin, my good friend. Um, we have an affectionate relationship. But for now, I am declaring him king. So he probably enjoys that very much, King Colin. Um, And because he is king, he has actually brought me under his control. And in order to bring me under his control, symbolically, he's already conquered me. He's already destroyed my kingdom. He's already moved and raided. and, And there is no other life that I can have except subjected to Colin. All right? So everything is there, but now it's a metaphor. Now it's a symbol. Now all the people are gathered, and they, say, they see who used to be the king, me, and now they see the conquering king, Colin, and they want to know, is Colin superior? I know he has stronger armies, but is he superior? And so this is how literal assembly, uh, uh, assembled symbolism took place as a New king conquered an old king. It's listed right there. Does Jesus say to any angels, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Literally, this is what happened. Everyone has gathered together. 
Everyone is looking at the new kingdom being reigned. The old kingdom bows to the new king. I knew Colin could handle all of this pressure. And then, (laughs) yes. And so now Colin is going to put his foot on my neck. Do it. No, do it. Do it. it. I'm not going to take you out. All right. Symbolism. (laughs) This is it. Thanks, Colin. (laughs) That's it. That's it. There's no trick. The king has conquered. The enemy has been defeated. The enemy is a footstool for the conquering king. God says, have I ever allowed an angel to put his feet on anyone? That's what he's saying. The answer is no. The only one who is worthy to put his feet on anyone, the only one who is the rightful king, the only one that is the creator of the universe, the only one that has provided redemption for all people, the only one that is worthy of worship is Jesus, the Son of God, the begotten Son of God. If you know anything about training dogs, you're like, where is this going? You know that you have to assess whether the dog of which you're training is an alpha dog. If the dog's not an alpha dog, they're a lot easier to train. But if they are an alpha dog, you have to convince them that they are no longer alpha. That there is someone else in the house that is alpha. And if the dog, no matter if they're alpha or in a different order, they will figure out who in the household is alpha and who is not. Whether that person is human, cat, bird, ceiling fan, it doesn't matter, they will differentiate who is in fact the alpha. In my household, we have two dogs, and it goes something like this. Me, Esther, sometimes. Angel, sometimes, but Jasper's right in the middle of those two. (laughs) Jasper's our beagle, right? Then Kara, because Kara just can, can be forceful, and Morgan. Morgan cannot get Jasper to, lay, to do anything. Jasper could care less what Morgan thinks, and, and it's very obvious. Then we have Daphne, the little precious Princess Daphne. She weighs literally six pounds, and she is a tiny little toy poodle slash miniature schnauzer, and it goes like this. Me, most of the time, Daphne. <laughs> she could care less about anybody else. Now, there's a training method to convince the dog that you or the person training is an alpha, and the way you do that, usually, is by pretending that your hand is actually the jaw of the mother or the animal that is the alpha. So when the dog does something, the natural habitat, if it does something that the alpha in a pack of dogs wouldn't want to do, what happens? The alpha of that pack makes sure that that dog knows, hey, you just did something that I will not allow. And so he bites... Not in, I'm going to rip your throat off, but he bites in such a way that warns the dog, you will not do that again. So common training practices for dogs is if you want them to know who's the alpha, you use your hand as a snout and you pin them. Just what I just did with Colin as he pinned me. It's that idea that says, no, you are not the boss. I am the boss. Now, I know some people who actually use their mouth to train dogs. I don't know why. But they do. So don't do that. But the point is this. It's to visually show Jesus is king. Jesus is to be worshipped. Jesus and Jesus alone is to be worshipped. So who are the enemies? Until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. There are many. But we will talk about Five, those who desire to make the cause of Christ fail are the enemies of the kingdom of God. Who else are enemies? The demons, Satan himself. Demons simply are angels that are fallen, angels that decided they would side with Lucifer rather than with God. Other enemies of the kingdom of God, false ideas, philosophies, worldviews. Who are the enemies of God? Evil persons. Now, oftentimes when we read the word evil persons, we think of somebody else, and yet 
oftentimes we are the enemy of the kingdom of God. Our own selfishness, our own pursuit, our own pride, our own desire, extreme desire for gratification. What does it mean to be an enemy towards the kingdom of God? And then finally, who are the enemies? Sinful impulses. Now what's beautiful about the image that the writer of Hebrews represents is that through the power of God, Jesus, God's son, the only begotten, the one that rules all of the universe, through Jesus, all of these things can be at his feet. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Your sinful impulses can be at the feet of Christ. Your evil desires can be at the feet of Christ. Other people's evil intentions can be at the feet of Christ. False ideas and philosophies and worldviews can be at the feet of Christ. Demonic activity can be at the feet of Christ. Those who desire to make the cause of Christ fail can be at the feet of Christ. Second Peter chapter 1 verses 3 and 4. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Jesus, his power, who he is, the identity that the author of Hebrews is describing to us of Jesus, he has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence as adopted children, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, adoption, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. And the role of angels, not to be sidetracked, but the role of angels is to help that happen. If you think God has given us everything so that you can pursue godliness, angels are part of your pursuit of godliness. They help. They help. So here's the question. How are you holding firm against the enemies of the cause of Christ? Have you found confidence in your identity? as an adopted child of God? Do you understand that resisting sinful impulses is worth it? Are you able to fathom Jesus' extreme care to uphold you toward purity, holiness, and righteousness? These are big questions. Are you holding firm against the enemies and the cause of of Christ? Have you found confidence in your identity as an adopted child of God? Do you understand that resisting sinful impulses is worth it? Are you able to fathom Jesus' extreme care to uphold you toward purity, holiness, and righteousness? And because of this confidence, are you willing to take a risk in establishing God's kingdom on earth? Verse 14 says, the angels are ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. I believe that what the author is trying to communicate is don't slip, don't give way. Life is hard. Global activities are wretched. Things seem to be going downhill. But Jesus entered this world. He entered this world as creator. He entered this world to purify sins. He entered this world to give freedom and redemption to his adopted children. Jesus is ready. He is the victor. He has destroyed sin. It is all at his feet. And so take heart. Be part of taking a risk for his kingdom because it is worth it. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Very interesting passage. And this is going to be the last point of tonight, but it's going to be in a bigger section. So I say the last point, but we've got a few minutes here to kind of unpack that. Matthew 16, 18 says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What do gates do? Someone, just real quick. What do gates do? Keep stuff out. That's what gates do. 
You close the gate, it says, don't come in here, right? So if God is going to build his church and the, the imagery that's given in this passage of scripture is the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It means Christians are not the ones going on retreat. It means Christians are the ones going on the offensive and the gates of hell have been shut and they say, stay out, stay out. We can't handle it. Jesus is victorious. Jesus' foot is on my neck. I have to hide and take cover because the movement of God is so forceful that we cannot bear it. Now, we may not see that happening in our world, but are we connected to the spiritual movement of God among all nations? That his word is going out, that his renown is being made known, that he is bringing people into his kingdom through his love and through his grace and through his connection with the church. Another passage, Ephesians chapter six. You know this passage, verses 10 through 19, nine verses talking about the activity of being part of God's advancing kingdom. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace in all all circumstances take up the shield of faith with which you can ex extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and, and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end keep alert with all perseverance making supplication for all the saints and also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. Read the first chapter of Hebrews again and then read that passage in Ephesians 6 and tell me if you don't find a confidence in putting on the armor of God and knowing that Jesus is superior. Tell me that when you read those two verses and your soul is so deep and heavy and tormented because of what is currently happening among believers in this world, among innocents in this world, among the, the absolute darkest places in this world that when you read this and you are nudged and you don't know what to do, that what it says in that is praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance. Why? Why be alert? Why be ready? Why storm the gates of hell? Why be a person that matters in the kingdom of God? Because you must pray for the perseverance of the saints. Those who are in Iraq, they're the Christians that are losing their lives on a daily basis. Those who are in North Korea that are losing their lives on a daily basis. Those who are in Syria that are losing their lives on a daily basis. Those who have been in Western and Southern Africa losing their lives on a daily basis. We live in a world that the kingdom of God is forcefully advancing. And we must ready ourselves because there is an enemy, but Jesus is victorious. We have to know that, we have to live that, we have to settle that in our hearts so that we can be active in what God is doing. The last verse, which is ironically the verse that Curtis and Jenna shared, it says this, Matthew 11, verse 12. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and the violent take it by force. The version that Jenna and Curtis put on the screen is this version, which makes, it helps make sense of the verse. It is the correct way to say it. Both are correct, but this helps us understand it in our language. The kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay hold of it. Now what's beautiful about Jesus saying this in Matthew, speaking about John the Baptist, is it actually parallels to Micah chapter two, verses 12 and 13. And Micah chapter two, verses 12 and 13 says this, I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will gather the remnant of Israel. I will set them together like sheep in a fold, like a flock in its pasture, a noisy multitude of men. 
Now, put yourself in the shoes of Jesus. Jesus is saying this about John the Baptist. What was John the Baptist's, Baptist's role? To prepare the way for Jesus' coming. So John the Baptist is here, and what Jesus is saying is, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has. What has the kingdom of heaven been doing? Micah shines light on that. I will set them together like sheep in a fold, like a flock in its pasture, a noisy multitude of men. He who opens the breach goes up before them. They break through the past, the gate, going out by it. Their king passes on before them, the Lord at their head. This is what Jesus is saying about the kingdom of heaven. It is breaking forth or breaking out. It is exploding. And all the people in this kingdom are breaking out of their bondage and laying hold of it. The kingdom of heaven is breaking forth like dynamite. And individuals are finding liberty and freedom. The imagery is the people have been gathered, the church is gathered. When you cage an animal, the animal gets restless. The animal's like, what are we going to do? I'm tired of being in this pen. I want to be in the pasture. I want to find freedom. I want to declare why freedom is better. And so they're gathered in the pen, and the person comes and gathers the pen, and then there's someone who comes and opens the gate. And when you open the gate of a caged animal who's ready to see the outside world, they explode into that world. Are you exploding? You have been gathered. You have been brought together. And Jesus has opened the gate. The kingdom of God is at hand. Here I am, Jesus says. I am God. I have been here from all time. I have been here to declare a mission for the church. I'm unleashing you. Explode. Show the world the beauty of redemption. Show the world the beauty of freedom. Show the world the forgiveness of sin. Show the world the reality of me being the center of your life. Show the world that Jesus is king. Jesus, without having to actually say it in Matthew 11, is alluding to the fact that he is the Messiah. Jesus is the king who will lead the sheep through the gate. So the final question that the writer of Hebrews leaves us with in Hebrews chapter one is this. Are you ready? Are you ready to burst out? Are you ready to explode? Are you ready to be that lit dynamite? Are you ready to make a difference in a world that desperately needs Jesus? not pluralism, a world that needs Jesus, not, well, I'm just not sure. Hebrews is saying to us in chapter one, Jesus is God. And so what must we do as his church to explode? God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth that comes through your word Thank you for the poignancy of knowing, Jesus, who you are. God, I pray that we would wrestle. I pray that we would get to our knees and persevere. I pray that we would humbly seek to know and to understand the depths of who you are. I pray that we would be people that pray for the global church, that pray for those who are being persecuted, that pray that your kingdom will continue to forcefully advance and that forceful men and women and children will take hold of it. I pray that we would be ready, that we would take on the full armor of God, that we would be confident that you have given us everything to live in godliness. May we be content because you have adopted us as your children. We surrender and we ask you to do what you need to do. Amen.